Thank you very much for inviting me along. As it's been mentioned, I've had a very varied career. Currently, I'm called a futurist. You may be wondering, well, what does a futurist do? And I want to demystify it because really what I do, I advise clients on how they can lean into trends because that's the key element here. If you learn how to lean into a trend, you can be using a good tailwind to make good progress rather than fighting a headwind. So that's where a futurist can help you think about how to move into the future. Now, one of my clients over the last handful of years has been the G20 and the World Bank through the Global Project for Financial Inclusion. And that has been focusing specifically on ways to work inside of developing economies and to help grow a, a developing economies, particularly by engaging small to medium enterprises and growing small to medium enterprises. And the work that I've done with them over the last half, uh, half a decade has led me to want to be very bold with all of you today. I've set a challenge for myself, and I, I'll set this out before you. What I did was I took a look at where Papua New Guinea is right now with a GDP of around $2,300 per capita. What we want to do is over the next billion seconds, that's about 30 years, we want to grow that into a middle income status, that's around where Malaysia is today, per, per capita income of about $9,500 per head, that's in 2017 dollars. You have to figure that that's an annual growth rate of somewhere between 5 and 6% over that next 30 years. So that's a low to middle income country, do it in 30 years. That was my first challenge. Now again, it's a billion seconds. I've recently launched a podcast that you can listen to called The Next Billion Seconds. I think of that as being a very good length of time because it's a generation and you can start the work today that really bears fruit in a generation. Now a billion seconds takes us all the way to 2050. And by putting the right processes into place today, PNG can be in an incredible position in 2050. And you already have a vision 2050 plan. My recommendations that I'm making you to today are designed to sit alongside that plan. Now, I set another challenge for myself, which was to respect the culture of Papua New Guinea, which has the distinction of being one of the least urban cultures in the world. It's because I want you to take these recommendations on board, and you can only do that if it's possible to implement these recommendations, which means they have to work for you. They have to work for PNG for where PNG is. So, I have my eyes on a goal for 2050, but I'm starting with my feet firmly planted on the ground. So, without further ado, first thing you need to understand, the smartphone is the most important tool we have invented probably since the ax. And I, that is not hyperbolic. And the interesting thing about the smartphone is the smartphone is much more important in the developing world than it is in the developed world. Now, all of us are probably walking around with very whizzy, maybe $1,000 smartphones if you have a high-end high iPhone or a high-end Android phone. A $50 smartphone, which is what they're selling in PNG these days, functionally is exactly the same. All of the rest of the other $950 we're paying for marketing people. You just have to admit it. A technology that was introduced only 10 years ago, in four years' time, is going to be completely pervasive. And it's going to be completely pervasive because it's so useful. And you'll see some of the uses as I go through this talk. But it can be used for communication, it can be used for commerce, it can be used for education, it can be used for community, it can be used for culture, on and on and on and on. We've only started to scratch the surface of what we can do with a smartphone. And this is something you need to understand. In 2020, 80% of all adults on planet Earth will be using a smartphone. So recommendation number one is simple, it's easy. Over the next five years, drive up the rates of smartphone ownership in PNG. Now, 
On the basis of my research, it looks like something between 40 and 50% of Papua New Guineans have a SIM card, so they have a mobile. Looks like 50 to 60% of people who have a mobile have a smartphone right now. So that's something between 20 and 25% of Papua New Guineans who have a smartphone right now. So over the next five years, make it a goal to raise that rate to the global rate of 80 to 85%, which is where we're gonna be in about 2022. Exceed the global average if you can. Now, at the same time that you do this, the other half of the recommendation is you're gonna to have to build out the infrastructure to support that so that the whole nation has good coverage and mobile broadband connectivity. Now, that's going to require investment, but it is a utility service. Utility service will promise regular revenue, so it's a good investment. But you have to think about how are you going to pay for the investment of all of the mobile infrastructure that PNG is going to need so that everyone has good, high-quality mobile service. Now, normally, companies do that by charging really high tariff fees. And the problem is, if you do that in a developing country, it disincentivizes people from using the devices and all the ways that you're going to want to use them to generate revenue. And we'll come to those in a minute. But I need to cover this first, because this is really important. High tariffs discourage users. So how do you realize revenue from a big mobile broadband build-out? The telcos are going to need to find another way to be able to realize revenue. And it, has to not rely primarily on charging a lot for voice and data traffic. So here's the third recommendation, and this is the one where you're probably gonna take your guns out and shoot at me. I want you to allow the telcos to go into banking. Mobile money is already offered in PNG. It can be a powerful accelerant to the economy. Mobile money is great because it brings everyone who's unbanked into the banking system. It provides a pervasive payment service for individuals and then for businesses. It creates an audit trail, which is really nice for the tax man. Now, what happens, what we've seen around the world is when mobile money gets introduced to an economy, there's usually a bit of a scuffle because the telecom regulator and the banking regulator have a bit of a turf fight. Who gets to control this? Who gets to run this? Who gets to regulate this? I suggest that the best way to make this work is to marry them. Put the two together. Let the telcos go into banking. Let the banks go into telecoms. Now, in practice, what that means is there's going to be some very interesting acquisitions. Digicel should probably be buying, what's the largest bank in PNG? So there you go. That's a marriage made in heaven. And I know everyone thinks this is going to be some unholy union, but what happens is the outcome of this is one of the most interesting businesses in the world because it's a business that understands both banking and communications and the fact that in the developing world those are two sides of the same coin. The profits that you make by bringing people into the banking system will amplify that banking system and that then pays off for the telco infrastructure build. So these are sort of three core infrastructure elements that you want to focus on in the next five years. You want to promote smartphone ownership as much as you can. You want to have low tariffs on voice and data by building out your infrastructure. And you want to have this combined banking and telco industry service offering. All right. So I've, I've told you what to do. Why are you doing this? Well, you're going to use this for banking, but you're going to use this for a lot more than banking. And it comes back to this idea that a smartphone is now becoming a universal tool. And we're going to start very simply just by using the smartphone to increase the capacity of the individuals who have smartphones. And one of the things that you want is you want every child in PNG to have access, presumably through a parent, to a smartphone. Why? One word. Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia already exists in English. It's got five and a half million articles in English. It exists in simple English. It actually already exists in talk pisin. But the interesting thing is, because I did a little research about that, when you go to the talk pisin entry in Wikipedia, there's only 
1,400 and some odd articles inside of that. So that's not even a child's encyclopedia, which would normally have about 20,000. This is something that I want you to take a look at. Now, I know Jimmy Wales, founder of Wikipedia. A couple of years ago when he was touring Australia, we had a deep conversation. I said, what does it take to get Wikipedia started in a particular language? It says it takes five dedicated individuals. That is the seed of a project that then will grow into a full version of Wikipedia. And those people mostly spend their time just translating articles other, out of other editions of Wikipedia. It's hard work for those five people. Those five people are true believers, but it's real work. So the next challenge I'm presenting to you is, can you find a way, maybe through the university, maybe through a community effort, to sponsor folks to get the talk person version of Wikipedia going strong, going, so that it's accessible to everyone in PNG? And I mention this because the other half of this recommendation is you're going to have the telcos offer Wikipedia for free just the same way they offer Facebook and Twitter for free today when you get mobile servers. You're going to want that because Wikipedia is pretty much the best learning tool we've yet come up with. And it's created by all of us. It is a reflection of all of us. Making it freely available makes it an opportunity for everyone to be involved, not just learning, but contributing to it. So as they learn, they will add their own entries. And you're going to have the best of all worlds, because you're going to have Papua New Guineans building their own version of Wikipedia, driven by their own needs, driven by their own interests. Obviously, the sections on rugby are going to be extensive. There's only one entry in the talk piss inversion on rugby right now, which tells me something. So this is the learning tool. For kids, it's the learning tool for adults. That's the point here, because a smartphone is the tool for communicating knowledge. It's a tool for commerce. But more than everything else, it's a tool for sharing. It's a tool for sharing what we know. It's a tool for sharing what we need. It's a tool for sharing what we have on offer. And best of all, this is something that works in the city and it works in the highlands because the signal reaches everyone everywhere. And where the signal reaches, the smartphones and the knowledge and the commerce follow. All of that's going to happen by itself, slowly. But this is the way the wind is blowing. So I want you to lean into it. I want you to prioritize the infrastructure that supports this kind of sharing. Place value on the kinds of sharing that improve the capacities of the nation, that improve the capacities of the people in the nation. What you'll do is you'll create a virtuous cycle of feedbacks. People will be learning more, and they will be learning how to learn more because you've built the infrastructure to support it. Now, getting all that done is going to take a little time. People move quickly, businesses move gradually, governments move glacially. But the government can frame a vision for where they want the nation to be in the early 2020s. Businesses will respond to that. Businesses will begin to plan for that world. People will step up and take their part in building that future. And in the background, the, the government's going to do the very slow, the very hard work of marrying the financial system to the telcos in a way that doesn't cause either of them to become wildly unstable. The Bank of PNG is going to be offering a lot of advice on how to make that work in a way that brings people into the banking system in a way that is sustainable and profitable. So yes, move slowly, but over the next five years, move deliberately. And do that because People aren't going to stop moving. This is already happening. They are already moving. You're going to need to keep pace with them so that by 2022, when they arrive and they have their smartphones and they're ready to use them to build the economy, you're going to be able to meet their needs. OK. Further, we move into the future. That's the first five years. Now we're going to take a look at the 10 years after that. So this is 2023. 2032. Further we move into the future, the more interesting it gets. 
Now, mobile money has been available in Papua New Guinea for a few years. It's a low-cost, low-impact way of bringing people into the banking system. It's only the starting point of where we're going. Now, around the same time the smartphone launched, 2007, 2008, another technology popped up. This one came straight out of banking. It's called a distributed ledger or a blockchain or a cryptocurrency, if you're being very, very technical, whatever word you want to use for them. It provides all of the advantages of physical banknotes and a lot of advantages besides. It turns money into something that is fully digital. So there's no worries about counterfeiting, there's no worries about cooked books, and it provides a complete secure audit trail of all the transactions. Probably a lot of you have heard of Bitcoin. That's the most well-known example of this. But in some ways, it's a really bad example. It's an exception because Bitcoin isn't connected to a central bank. Now, the folks who are Bitcoin believers think that's the best quality of it, but it's the thing that makes central bankers and bankers in general go white because all they worry about is all the ways that people abuse that because it floats free from any regulation. But that said, bankers really like the idea of digital money, so they're now having a go. And for the last several years, what we've seen is a number of central banks, including some of the nations that are close to Papua New Guinea, have been developing their own digital currencies. And so earlier this year, Singapore, the, cent the monetary authority, announced that they were working on a way to hook their different, their central banks in that part of the world together using a blockchain, using a digital ledger. And that's a great step for the central banks because it allows the central banks to do their clearances very efficiently, but that's really only the beginning of where this is going. The Singaporeans are also now looking at creating a digital version of the Singapore dollar. So that's dollars, that's real money issued by the monetary authority in digital form. That money's ever, only ever going to exist in digital form. All right, why would you do this? Why is there a rush to do this? Well, it goes back to the birth of these digital currencies. They pop up around the same time as the smartphone. That's not really an accident. A smartphone provides incredible capacity. The one thing a smartphone doesn't do well is finance. It doesn't really do financial transactions. What we've had to do is we've had to have all of these situations where people bolt a credit card onto their smartphone. That's how we do transactions on a smartphone right now. That solution is clunky and it only works where a majority of the population have credit cards. And there's a lot of places in the world where that's not the case, including PNG. So if you want to make a smartphone an instrument of commerce, and you do that so that people can trade with one another wherever they are, if you would want that, then you have to create a form of money that works well with a smartphone, and that's digital money. So digital money and smartphones, they go together like bread and butter. Each one of them is activated by the other. So mobile money is a great place to start on this journey, but it is not the end. And so over the next decade, I, that, that I really do recommend that PNG move to a fully digital money economy. The technology to do this is not expensive. It is not difficult to use. When you get around to it after 2022, it's going to be a lot easier. There's going to be sort of uh, very nice roll your own solutions. And if you get smartphone ownership rates to 80 or 85% by 2022, 2023, there's going to be a broad base of Papua New Guineans who are ready to use digital money. Digital money doesn't just give every individual access to the banking system. It basically turns every individual into a bank. Now, that doesn't mean that everyone's going to be running around doing fractional reserve lending. That's not what I mean. But it means that every individual who's working with digital money has the same capacity to manage money as a bank does. And they can hold digital money as securely as any bank. And so 
When that happens, you're going to find individuals and businesses will be able to trade as they never have been able to trade before. There's not going to be any question about access to the banking system or even access to capital. Capital is going to be available everywhere because the banking system is going to be everywhere. Now, the flip side of distributed ledgers is not just that they allow you to track money, but they allow you to track ownership. And this is proving really vital in other parts of the world where land title has never really been well documented because it creates an unbreakable chain of custody for land title. And that's going to be valuable in PNG as well, but that's just the beginning because what we're going to see is all trade goods agricultural, mineral, industrial goods, it really doesn't matter. All of them are going to be tracked, all of them are going to be traded via digital ledgers. Farmers are already using this technology. This is a Sydney-based company called AgriDigital. What they're doing is they're allowing the farmer to securitize their crop. They can drop it off at a grain storage facility. It enters a distributed ledger. If someone wants to buy that crop, they have to put an entry in the ledger indicating that they actually have the money to do it. And the transfer happens and the farmer is paid immediately at point of sale, which is something that hadn't happened in Australia before. These farmers were always the last ones to be paid in this. So this technology is now available and it's now a way of being able to think of being able to connect farmers to a market in a way that is safe and secure and verifiable. This is the part that's vitally important because right now it is hard and expensive and slow to form markets everywhere. It's not just true in PNG. With distributed ledgers, it starts to become easy and fast and cheap. So when people want to trade goods and services, there's going to be a mechanism in place that makes it easy to do so. And it's a mechanism that's going to be connected to the smartphone that everyone is carrying around with them. So this now means that we're making a transition into a money economy plus because we have both an economy of digital money and a trade economy which looks like this weird echo of the barter economy, but it's so connected to the digital money economy through exchanges that it is always completely monetizable. I know it all sounds a little complex, but for most people who are engaging this in this, it's not going to be any more complicated than using a smartphone app. And so the second recommendation for this decade is that Papua New Guinea create the space and create the conditions for local talent to be able to focus on the kinds of app development that facilitate the management of digital economies and the trade economy. Now you already have Kumul Game Changers, which is a program that's geared at app entrepreneurs in PNG. Lean into that program. Listen closely to the needs of people and businesses in PNG and let that guide them as they get creative. You can use this as a tool to solve problems. So what are the kinds of things they're going to create? Well, some of it's going to look like banking apps that we have today. Some of it's going to look like Australia's Gumtree. Some of it's going to look like China's Alibaba. Some of it's going to look like America's eBay. It's going to have edges of all of that. And some of it's going to look like a commodity, commodity exchange like you'd see in Chicago. There are going to be different apps for different situations for different needs. But if you make it easy for people to trade by providing the infrastructure and then the apps sitting on top of that infrastructure, people are going to trade. And they will be enjoying the benefits of an advanced digital money economy. Because all of these advantages are going to be de delivered by that universal tool of the smartphone. And that smartphone is going to work well wherever they are because of the infrastructure investments that you're going to be making over the next five years. So 
The third recommendation is that P&G make the necessary investments in educating its people on how to make the best use of those tools. And that's actually a conversation because you can produce these tools as you're teaching people how to make best use of these tools, you're going to learn how to make those tools better. You start with mobile money commerce, digital money applications, trade applications, step by step by step, in conjunction with the release of these apps, you guide PNG into a market economy that is both very powerful and because of the way that it's been designed, very decentralized. And I want to point this out, this does not pose a threat to banking as we've known it, very much the opposite. Because most of the traders, when they approach scale, will tie themselves into formal banking organizations. They're going to be keeping digital money in a bank when they aren't actually using it for trade. Digital currency amplifies the reach of a bank, just as it amplifies the capacity of an individual. What it does mean is that the banks will be running to keep up with the developments. Because this is a huge change. We're going to be moving from a physical money economy where banking is rare and difficult and expensive into a digital money economy where banking is ubiquitous and cheap and easy. That transition is going to take some time, mostly for the bankers, less for the people. And that's why this second part of the strategy takes an entire decade to implement. You're going to have the infrastructure in place at the beginning of that decade. And you can start to roll out and test the first digital money services. But there's going to need to be time to learn what works and what doesn't work and what can be made better. There's going to need to be time to learn how to do it right. For example, 10 years ago, 2007, the first mobile money system was introduced called M-Pesa, introduced in Kenya. They had no idea that it was going to mushroom into something that is now taking up about 60% of the currency flow in the nation is now flowing through M-Pesa. And a couple of years ago at a G20 event, I got a chance to talk to the central bank governor who had approved M-Pesa, and he said to me, if he ever knew the disruption it was going to have, he never would have done it. It's the kind of thing that in hindsight is, is, is exciting, but at the time, if you're a central banker and you're looking for stability, why would you do something like this? But it went out there. People used it. They realized as they used it that they needed more than just peer-to-peer -peer money services, which is what the original version provided. They needed merchant services. And so there was a startup that provided those merchant services. And when those merchant services were provided, they realized they now had an audit trail from all of the businesses that they'd brought in to the mobile money system. And so they built analytics tools to help those businesses. And then from those analytics, they were able to pre-qualify those businesses for lines of credit from Kenya's banks, and they were able to do it for a fraction of what it cost Kenya's banks to do it. And so what happens was mobile money ended up very efficiently connecting SMEs to the banking system. That wasn't the intention. There was no grand plan there when they got started. They learned their way into this by listening and watching and responding. And PNG is going to present exactly the same sorts of opportunities as it transitions into a digital money economy. Look at how people trade. How can you help that? What sorts of tools do people need to extend their reach? How can you bring people into a trading economy that's fully digital? These are questions. We don't necessarily have all of the answers to these questions. All right, so one more thing before we finish up with this decade and move into the last half of the billion seconds. Logistics. How do you move things around from one place to another in a country which is largely rural, difficult terrains? Well, the answer to that, believe it or not, is obvious. During that decade of 2023 to 2032, high capacity autonomous drones they will carry several hundred kilograms. They're going to become familiar, 
They're not going to be cheap, but they're going to be affordable. Now, these drones are fully autonomous. They fly themselves, and they're electric. They run on a charge, so they're inexpensive to operate. With the deployment of autonomous drones, and this is autonomous cargo drones, the marginal cost of moving things across Papua New Guinea is going to drop to a fraction of the current cost. Conversation I had this morning, apparently there was a head of lettuce on offer in a, a store that was connected to a hotel in Port Moresby. It was grown in the highlands. It cost 60 kina. So this is telling you something about the logistics cost of moving things from the highlands to the city. Lean into the coming wave of drones that are going to be coming out. That's my final recommendation for this decade, is that you invest in the necessary infrastructure and air traffic control systems to make the widespread deployment of cargo drones easy across the entire country. By the way, most of these drones are vertical takeoff and landing, so you don't even need an airstrip for them. Okay, so before we really get stuck into the last half billion seconds, I want to talk about drones for a second because they illuminate something that's going on here. It's been described that the reason that we have drones popping up everywhere now is because a drone is effectively a smartphone that someone has strapped propellers onto. All of the smarts that you need to keep a drone correctly balanced and on course and have it fly autonomously, all of that can be done by the smartphone that's sitting in your pocket right now. So you don't need any huge technology leap from where we are today to get autonomous drones flying all over Papua New Guinea. And we see all sorts of interesting drone designs. I'm actually mentoring a project that's happening at the University of Sydney's startup program called Incubate right now, where he's designing a drone that's designed to carry one 150-kilogram human passenger. And you give that guy another couple of years, that thing's going to be ready for market. He's doing it. And because he's doing it, we also know that there are hundreds of other people doing it. And there's going to be this wave of cheap cargo drones coming out of China over the next few years. We're already well on the way there. Now, there's another way of thinking about what you can strap to a smartphone. And through another connection at the University of Sydney, I met Dr. Salas Sukaraya. He runs the Australian Center for Field Robotics. And he's got a startling vision for what's possible in farming robotics. So, oh, there, that's, that's an actual drone that's in production that can carry a person around right now. So, a farming robot sounds very expensive and very complicated. It's anything but. You're going to watch. Now, this is a field test in Indonesia from last month. You're going to watch them assemble it in the field. Essentially, this farming robot is two wheels. It's two wheels with a small but very powerful computer controlling their operation. It uses a camera to examine the crops for pests, for insects. It advises the farmer on exactly where they need to apply pesticides or fertilizer so they have minimal inputs and maximum outputs. All of that kit sounds very expensive. The farming robots that they're testing now, they're using a smartphone for the brain. That's the thing that's sitting up there at the top of the uh, cantilever. So we're coming back to this idea of the smartphone again and again and again. And if you think that that kit's expensive, they're aiming to make this cost less than $2,000. Now, yes, for a single farmer, that's expensive if it's owned among a village and it increases productivity significantly, which it does, then maybe that expense is affordable. In fact, maybe there's a business there in financing that. And because the smartphones are connected to mobile broadband networks, because you've deployed that technology in the first five years, these farm robots are all very well connected. They scan the crops, they see what's needed for them, they share that information with the broader community of farmers and farm robots all across PNG. So all of these farm robots and all of these farmers are all learning from one another. A farm robot is not just a dumb tool, 
it's connected, it's intelligent, and it brings that intelligence to every farmer. And so the robots make the farmers better farmers, smarter farmers, more productive farmers. And again, $2,000 because it's built from off-the-shelf parts. So the smartphone isn't just going to transform logistics over the next billion seconds. It's going to transform farming. And in fact, where you can't get a farming robot, the farmer is just going to take their smartphone and use the camera and scan the crops. And an app on the smartphone will connect up line and it will still be able to tell the farmer maybe how to solve a problem they're having with a pest or how to actually treat the crop in just the right way to maximize their yield. So that's the turning point in this last half billion seconds from about 2033 to about 2048. The smartphone starts to become something else. It starts to become a channel to real intelligence. Now we hear an awful lot about artificial intelligence these days. We hear that the robots are going to be putting us all out of work. It's not really true. It's certainly not going to work that way in PNG. What artificial intelligence is going to do is it's going to make us better at what we do. So you're going to have a nurse maybe working in the highlands. She's going to have access to world-class medical resources because they're going to be available through her smartphone. She's got a smartphone-based blood testing kit. I've already seen this in production, and that's helping her so that samples don't have to go back to a lab. She can test things right then and there. That's all running off the smartphone that's connected to it. So she's bringing high-quality medical care with her everywhere that she goes because she's connected. Same is going to be true for teachers who no longer work alone but are working with Wikipedia and all of the other resources that have been created by educators, not just in PNG but everywhere else in the world. All of those resources are fantastic. A lot of those resources already exist. It's the way that we're going to be using them that's going to start to change because we're all going to be learning all of the time, no matter where we are, no matter what we do. That learning is going to come to us through our smartphones. And unlike today, it's not going to be about going out and finding things. It's going to actually turn around. Instead, things are going to come to us because our smartphones are getting smarter. Our smartphones are already with us all of the time. They already watch what we do. They already see what we're interested in. They know what we need to know. And they're going to be learning from that. So our smartphones are going to become artificial intelligences in their own right. And as they learn from us, they're going to start helping us to make us better at whatever we're trying to do at that moment. So, everyone with a smartphone, and that's pretty much going to be everyone at the end of the next billion seconds, and that's everyone in Papua New Guinea, everyone's going to be working in partnership with a device that is working as hard as it can to make them smarter and more capable and more resilient. A farmer's a better farmer, a nurse is a better healer, a teacher is a better educator, a student is a better learner, and that's going to happen everywhere, not just in PNG, because the middle of the 21st century is going to be dominated by rising intelligence everywhere, just as the beginning of this century has been dominated by rising automation. And that intelligence is the final ingredient that lifts Papua New Guinea into a new kind of economy. It lifts it into an economy that is decentralized and rural, but connected and very smart. And our technology has never allowed that. For the last 5,000 years, we have had to be urban in order to be materially successful. So, Papua New Guinea is hitting its stride at exactly the moment that that's no longer true. The technologies of connectivity make it possible to be smart in place, to be connected in place, to be commercial and trading in place. And it's that which you have to lean into.
So my final recommendation for this half billion seconds, that last half billion seconds that takes you to 2050, is that you do everything in your power to amplify your natural position as one of the most rural nations on Earth. That's always been an obstacle. It is now an opportunity. Because to make things work well in Papua New Guinea, they have to be decentralized. They have to work across the villages and the communities that are spread across the entire length of the country. And that is the promise of what we can do now. But promise is one thing. Papua New Guinea is where things have to live up to that promise, which means Papua New Guinea is the ideal place to develop the cornerstone technologies of the 21st century, a century that's going to be both more urban and more rural than ever before. Because what's going to happen is the advantages of the city over the bush are going to disappear. And as that happens, people will move freely between them. And right now, that migration has been all one way. But because of what will develop in Papua New Guinea over the next billion seconds, the city and bush are going to find a new accommodation. They're going to define a new kind of culture. And that's why I am so excited for your future. Because Papua New Guinea is the future. The choices that you make today about where you put your attention, about where you put your investment, they will determine how that future looks to you and they will determine how much that future owes you. Thank you.